Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this presentation of Using and Preparing Wild Edibles by Vione Graham. Uh, this event is presented by Naturescaping of Southwest Washington and the Camas Public Library. My name is Elliot Stapleton, and I am from the Camas Public Library. Um, I know more people are coming in right now, uh, but before we get started, I just wanted to uh, share a couple things. Uh, after the presentation, you will be able to ask by own questions, um, and you'll do that using the chat function in Zoom. Uh, below, uh, you should see an icon uh, that says chat on it. However, right now, uh, that function is disabled. Uh, so what will happen is after Vion's presentation, I'm going to turn that on and then you can use that chat bar to ask questions after the presentation is over. Uh, I'll also be uh, hopping back on and I'll help moderate uh, those questions. Uh, I also wanted to let you know that if you'd like to learn more about Naturescaping of Southwest Washington, which is a nonprofit organization, and they maintain a wildlife botanical gardens in Brush Prairie. Uh, if you want to learn more about the organization, you can visit their website, which is naturescaping.org. Uh, you can learn how to visit the gardens in Brush Prairie and how to become a member. Uh, you can also find out information about uh, supporting them through donations during this difficult time. Again, that website is naturescaping.org. Uh, I also want to share that this event will be uh, recorded. Uh, so if you would like to um, see it again or share it with a friend, um, I will be sending out an email uh, probably early next week uh, to all the people that have registered and you'll get a link where you could watch this presentation again. It'll also live on the Camus Public Library's uh, YouTube page. So uh, look out for that email. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our presenter, Bayon Graham, who has greatly enjoyed being a master gardener since 2015, and she can begin her presentation using and preparing wild edibles. So over to you, Bayon. Welcome. We are going on an exciting journey today. Whether you are a novice, wild edible forager, or experienced, I hope you are ready to have your eyes open to the many, many ways to use and prepare some wonderful foods. To quote Ralph Waldo Emerson, and what is a weed? A plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered. My hope today is that you become acquainted with the virtues of some wonderful weeds. Be sure to jot down questions you might have as we go along so that we can talk at the end of the presentation. I also have three handouts that are going to be sent your way with some of the information in this presentation. As a young child in Idaho, I was always interested in plants, picking bouquets of wild flowers, eating young milkweed pods, sucking the nectar from clover blossom florets, and feasting on wild asparagus. When I had a family of my own, I spent a lot of time with them identifying wildflowers and plants. Camping trips always included a journey of wonders. Now my grandchildren are learning to the joys of such pleasures. Along the way, I became intrigued on learning the incredible nutritive value of them. So naturally I moved into learning about and searching the treasures of wild edibles. So now the journey continues with more exciting experiences. As a master gardener, wanting to be a master gardener for years I had been, it was on my bucket list and I have not been disappointed. Wonderful journeys, receiving knowledge and giving it to the community has been great. I love it. Now as a master gardener, I cannot teach you and, and present to you, tell you to, what to eat and how to eat it because of the liability. So I lay my badge aside as a master gardener and as a fellow forager and friend, I will share my knowledge and experience with you. I hope to learn from you too. So be sure to put down the questions and, and also information that you can pass on to me. Foraging for wild edibles really does benefit us with flavorful foods if we are willing to step into new flavors and textures of these fresh, organic, and relatively free fruits and vegetables. 
Wild Edibles is an excellent source of nutritious food with minimal expense. I am not going to tell you the great nutritive benefits, so your homework is to go home to your computer and look it up. I will venture to say that you will be really surprised at the nutritive value of these wonderful plants. Wild plants come with bland, pungent, tart, and bitter taste that require you to pay attention to detail in gathering, preparing, and using them. I will be giving you a lot of information and there is a lot more information out there with great experts. I am not an expert, but have some experience and a willingness to learn and study more. My counsel for beginning foragers is to start with two or three basic plants that you might be interested in and learn all about them for accurate identification, harvesting, preparing, and using so that you have all the important knowledge you can get for safe foraging. Then when, you, when you're sure that you know your plants, expand to one or two more the same way and so on. Just take baby steps. If you are a more experienced forager, branch out to new plants or find new uses for the ones that you know. Now, are you ready? We are going on a venture. I call these the five important P's of this adventure. We're going to learn about practicing safe foraging, pursuing forage treasures, preserving found treasures, preparing food treasures, and precautions are a must. Now, number one, safety is number one. Do not consume anything unless you have absolute proof that you have correctly identified the plant with at least four characteristics from three or more reliable resources. Knowledge, is power and safety. Now I'm going to give you three points to remember for success and safety. Number one, only experiment and eat plant parts that you know are edible. Some whole, you can eat the whole plant and some you can eat only parts. For instance, the elderberry, you can eat the flowers and the berries, but do not consume the leaves. And number two, only experiment and eat plant parts at the proper life stage. For instance, dandelion greens, they are just tender and juicy before they flower. But as they flower, they become more bitter. And as they age, they become more bitter. And then three, know how to prepare the plant parts. Some you can eat raw and others only cooked. For instance, miner's letter, lettuce is a tender, sweet, very succulent, tasty, fresh green. And then you have stinging nettles. You can't eat those raw. At least, well, I suppose you could, but you wouldn't want to. But they are wonderful cooked or dried. They don't have any of the sting left. So just watch your safety as number one. Now we're going to learn about what we are going to find. There's bot bot botanical names, uh, Latin, oh bother. But botanical versus common name is very important. There is only one botanical name to each plant, whereas they can have many common names or nicknames depending on the regions, the ethnicity and folklore. Same, same common names are used with, for more than one plant often, such as amaranth, its proper name, and it is also called wild spinach, pigweed, redweed, careless weed, tumbleweed. Its Latin name is Amar Amaranthus rectoflexus, and that does not change. Lamb's quarter is called pigweed, wild lettuce, the same as for amaranth, and also white goosefoot, fat hen. Its Latin name is Chenopodium album. It's important for identification to use those Latin names. There's also the characteristics that you will learn, the leaves, stems, flowers, where it's located, the seeds. Those are all important things to know. We will have a slide later that will 
touch on that. And where, where are the safe places? There are some. Avoid environmentally contaminated areas. No roadsides or railroads because of engine emissions and herbicide sprays. Know if your area has had herbicides and pesticides sprayed. Watch for animal waste, drainage runoffs, because of pesticides and herbicides and animal waste often flow into these ponds or runoffs. Parks and commercial places often have used herbicides and pesticides. Be prepared to wash your harvestings. Okay, when? When can we harvest these? We can harvest them spring, summer, fall, and even winter. Know the de development stage. It could be different in different elevations. Early in the morning is the best time to harvest the plants because they have rejuvenated during the night and are refreshed. They haven't had the daytime heat stress and are fully hydrated. And our responsibilities are important. Never harvest the first plant you find. Make sure there are others available and only harvest what parts you will use, such as tips, shoots, flowers, berries, leaves. Be a good steward, only just to hear a little and there a little. Hardy perennials like dandelions can be easily harvested, but be careful with tender annuals. Their purpose is not to give us unlimited food, but to progenerate, have offspring, and future generations. So be conscious about overforaging and also use as soon as possible. As soon as any plant is picked, it begins to lose nutrients and flavor. Harvest the plant at the appropriate age of growth for the purpose that you want, such as tender leaves, you want to get them young, or flowers or roots, and then properly prepare them. If it's too late in the stage of growth, they are tough, very bitter, just not good unless that's what you're looking for. Wild edibles most often have better nutrition, are fresher, and grow in better soil. Packed with wonderful, powerful nutrients and flavor than even the most of the supermarket and garden produce that we get. Perhaps that's because of hybridizing and depleted soil. Believe it or not, international chefs have been using weeds in elite restaurant cuisine for years. There's a lot of information out there from the Native Americans too, from their experience and their knowledge that's been handed down. One of the books that I have in the resources that you will get a copy of is Plants of the Pacific Northwest Coast by Jim Pojar and, and Andy McKinnon. There's lots of great knowledge of Indian inf information there. Okay, we're going to dig into the dreadful botanical names. Okay, these names, these are family names. And the ones that I have here are the ones that have quite a few edibles in them, but there's also other families that have edibles in them. Um, the one, Umbelliferaceae, that is the ones that, um, our, their seeds are high in oils and they have umbrella tops like Queen Anne's legs, but there's several toxic plants that are in it, this group like poison hemlock and water hemlock, and we'll talk about those later. And then there's Asteraceae, which is the largest family of flowering plants, insulin rich roots. And these is included in the, that's dandelions and yarrow and those, that group. And the rosaceae is the apple, rose, and blackberry family. Lots of good things in that to eat. Lamiaceae, that is the highly high in volatile oils, square stems, opposite leaves, fragrant leaves. Can you guess? That's the mint family. And the fabaceae is the pea family, nitrogen fixer for soils, which include clover and vetch. There's also several toxic plants in this family that you need to watch for. And the Brassicaceae, Brassicaceae is that that's the spicy family, the field mustard, shotweed, garlic mustard, all those. Okay, so now that's the major family names. Now under that, usually you will only see the genus and the species names. And the genus is what is called, I call it the general. It includes a bunch of things. And then the species is the specific one. 
Like for instance, the um, brassica is the genus of the field muster and the species is the rapa. And so just those are the two that you're gonna know and know that the brassica is, the, the genus is always capitalized and the species is not capitalized. Now, if there is a variety of that, like there's different varieties of carrots, there's different varieties of, of different things anyway, that will always have a single quote bracket around it in the name. But most of the time, you're just going to see the genus and species names. And that's what you're going to be watching for. And notice the pictures on this slide. You can see two different plants. And that is what we talked about before. The top one is the, the um, lamb's quarter. And it has the uh, white kind of gray shade to it in the center and on the underside of the leaves. And that's um, what gives it the name of the album is its um, species because of that white. And then of course the pigweed or the amaranth is the bottom one, which they do look alike, but they are definitely different and are called the same thing often. Okay, now we're going to look at some of the characteristics that you will look for when you are uh, identifying your plants. There will be, and th these will be in the, uh, your resources in the books and or the literature that you have on them. They will give these, this information and um, tell you what the shape of the flower to look for for a certain plant. Leaf shapes, leaf tips are another one. Leaf margins, the edges of the, of the leaves, they will describe. And then the leaf base, how it is shaped at the base of the leaf. And then leaf attachments, how they're attached to the, the stem, whether it's got a petiole or whatever it's got, it will tell you. And then your leaf arrangements, whether they're opposites or they're uh, alternates, whatever they are, whirled, all those different shapes, they will give you that information. And how the plant habit, whether it is uh, erect, whether it's a climbing plant, whether it uh, creeps along the ground, different things like that. And this is a very small um, uh, thing of flower uh, arrangements because there's a lot, lot more. But just know that there are different ones. You need to study up on them and know what they are. The umbel has several different um, types of flowers, whether it has the blossom at the end of the, uh, the little parts or anyway, they're just, just know that, that it's important to, to see these um, characteristics and understand them and know them so that you can identify a lot easier. Okay, our responsibilities. This is our next important thing. Be respectful. If you're going on somebody's proper, property, ask permission. You know, it could be that they're a fellow forager and you're going and picking their food. So just be careful and ask permission. And if you happen to dig anything, fill your holes in so somebody else isn't, hasn't had the danger of stepping in the hole or an animal stepping in the hole. Uh, just important to just, just be respectful. And then know your, late, your uh, local, state, and national forest regulations. Um, you can get harvest permits in the national forests uh, and um, get some wonderful foraging there. But know that you need to know where those um, the harvest permits, what, what they cover and the maps that cover them. Um, I went, took my sister up into the mountains a couple of years ago to, and we just were driving around enjoying everything and we saw some beautiful black caps on the hillside. And so we stopped and picked some black caps and came home and, and I told, was telling my husband about it and he looked at me and he said, okay, where did you pick them? And I told him and he said, which side of the road were you on? And I told him and he said, um, that's the wrong side of the road. So here again, I'm just telling you, know those maps and those regulations. Okay, do not overforage. If there's a few plants, don't pick them. Know that flowers are reproduction, future food. Use only the parts that you need. Don't pull a whole plant up if you're just going to do leaves or some flowers. Uh, just be careful of that. Uh, when we were going, when I was going through my master garden training class, we had a field trip with an instructor from Clark College to explore forest trees, plants, and fungi. While crossing a bridge, 
we came, saw some skunk cabbage and someone voiced the question to the leader about the edibility of them. He answered that they were not poisonous. A few brave souls took a bite of the leaf, myself included, and chewed it up. Soon our lips and tongues began to tingle. Yes, we found out that the leaves have some tiny sharp crystals of calcium oxalates, making the plant edible only if it's cooked well first. We had a good chuckle about that, but learned an important lesson. Do not experiment or eat wild plants or plant parts you do not know to be edible and how to make them edible if they can be. Know that elevation change it, changes the plant developmental stage, which definitely affect the texture and the taste. Know the life cycles of your plants, Good growing conditions versus stress conditions changes the growth stages, the texture, and the taste. For instance, chickweed is generally a real tasty plant eaten fresh. At the same time of the season, it will taste different in one area than another because of the growing conditions. Maybe sweeter soil, better shade, hot weather isn't affecting them quite so much in that spot. Just know that. If you taste something and you think, oh, that does not taste very good, that doesn't mean maybe somewhere else it might taste a little sweeter. Okay, the next 13 slides, I, I'm helping you understand what is available seasonally. And I have a printout of this that will be sent out to you. Okay, the first seasonal gifts. Um, we have uh, and know that this is just a sampling of what you can harvest. This is just some of my favorite ones. Um, and some of the plants will actually even fit into multiple seasons. I'm only going to use the common names used in our area to make it easier than using the botanical names. Okay, see the graph we have, spring, you can get lots and lots and lots of fresh greens. In the summer, you can get some, not quite as many, but quite a few. In the autumn, you have quite a bit less and then in the winter, you still can get some, but they, they're just not as much. So I'm going to go through the names of some of these here for you. I don't know if you could have recognized them. Um, if you don't recognize them, maybe you can jot down the names and you can go home and you can do some more research on them. Uh, we have sheep's sorrel, and that is really tasty. It's got its own little flavor in the spring. It's really a good one. And in the bottom, next to the sheep sorrel is shotweed or bittercress. Now, if you like watercress, which I do love, just got that little snappy bite to it. Um, this is a good substitute. I'm out, when I'm out in the garden weeding and I see that, I just pick it up, shake it off really good and then nibble on those leaves. It's just got just the nice little tender snappy bite. And um, then we have chickweed, which is readily available all year long. It, it even grows in the winter. Um, and it is just a tender, sweet, crawling little plant that just is tasty, sweet, and tender. And then we have purslane. And it is, it's a, a really, it's kind of a succulent looking plant. It's got leaves full of moisture and its stems are full of moisture. It's just a real, really tendy, tender, sweet, good little um, plant to eat. Know that this one is an, an unusual in the fact that in the morning, it's going to taste, have a little bit of a tart taste to it. And then during the daytime, the sun will sweeten it and in the evening, it will be sweet. So uh, preferring your choice, morning or evening harvesting. And then we do, next to it, we do have the, um, the lamb's quarter which is one of the highest nutritious plants that you can get. And it really is a lot like spinach when you cook it or use it. It tastes a lot like it. Up above, we have two plantains, the broadleaf and the narrowleaf. And they both are edible in their young, young stage, not when it's blossoming like the bottom one, but when it's just coming up, it's really tender and it's, got a nice flavor. It's got a sharp flavor. Uh, it's not just a bland flavor. So it's one that's really best mixed with other vegetables for other greens for salads and stuff. And the seeds on the uh, wide mouth have a seed 
a stem that the seeds are all up the whole stem, whereas the narrow one you can see has the seeds and flowers on the end of the stems. And then we have miner's lettuce, which is a real delicacy. It's just tender and sweet and just yummy. The Siberian um, lettuce on the top is very unique. You can tell it readily by the shape of its leaf with its little cup and the blossoms coming out of the middle of it. And the, the one just below it, that is miner's lettuce. And it is another just tender sweet. Its little flowers are a, a white with a little pink stripe in them. My kids, we call them candy flower. And it's readily available everywhere. It's really tasty and nice. And the prime eating is before flowering. Be sure and remember that. Um, and use the top one and a half tips of your taller plants. That encourages growth on, on them and uh, encourages tender young leaves to keep coming. The more sun that the plant gets, if it's a better, bitter species, it will be more bitter. And over the winter, it doesn't quite have as much taste. Okay, now we're going on to the graph with the pot herbs. Now a pot herb is something that you cook. It's a plant that you will cook, um, like your spinach and things like that. And so there's a lot of wonderful ones. Some of these plants you probably do not, you think, oh, I've seen that plant, but you don't recognize it as, as an edible. Mallow is one of them, I think. Mallow also is, um, just an inconspicuous little plant that just kind of just spreads out and creeps around. But it, it is also an edible one. And the mustard just above it is also uh, stir fries. You, you know, just use it however you want to use it, even fresh. But, and then lamb's quarter. This is the seeds, uh, the blossoms of the lamb's quarter. And those are really tender and soft and, and juicy on that too. And we have cattails. And the cattails in the spring, you can dig their roots and they are just really tasty, um, peeled and, and cleaned up and, and eaten. And then the stems also in the spring, in the summertime when they're starting to grow, you can actually pull up the cattail stalk and then peel off the outer leaves. And at the base, you have a really tasty, just cut it up into pieces and just cook it like you would any vegetable. It's really good. You can also, uh, if you catch the blossoms on the top, the cattail head, before it turns brown, you can cook them, uh, boil them, and then cook, eat them like you would corn on the cob, leave the stem in the center. It's quite, I've not tasted it, but everybody I've talked to have really thought it was really great. I have trouble finding cattails because most of them grow in uh, watery areas, and, and I just have not found one that I felt comfortable that the water wasn't a runoff from something else. So if you ever find one, let me know, because I would love to harvest some of them. And then in the bottom we have dock. And this is another one that's got a good flavor to the leaves. Um, just don't let them get too big or too old. They're better off when they're just here. And then believe it or not, the next slide is some uh, fur tips that I harvested. And you're gonna be surprised what you can do with fur tips. They're really, really good little things to to have. Um, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. And then we have um, uh, nettles up at the top. And um, I was cooking, I cooked dinner one evening after we got done. I said to Jerry, my husband, I said, how did you like your greens? Were they okay? And he stopped and he looked at me over the top of his glasses and he said, what was it? And I laughed and I said, it was nettles. <laughs> and he laughed, he said, I thought it was spinach. <laughs> and so, um, and then dandelions, they are really good tender too. Now they have a little tiny bit of bitterness to them, but bitter is good for dis digestion. Don't, don't hesitate to eat a few bitters because they really are good for us. If you uh, want to, you can cut the, the stem center of the, of the leaf out, that stem shaft out of there, and, and you won't have quite as much bitter, but um, they're good. These are nutritional powerhouses packed with nutrients. Um, if the stem snaps easily on the plant, it is a tender plant. And mallow actually can make a marshmallow-like edible treat. In one of the books that I recommend that I give you a resource to, John Callis, in edible wild plants, he actually um, has a way of making 
this has a recipe in there in his book on this marshmallow like treat. Uh, some greens only need a short time of steaming or boiling. Don't throw away the juice after steaming or boiling. It's full of great nutrients. Some leaves for tea, they're fresh or dried. They are really good. And I had a grand I have a grandson. We went camping recently and we had there was a, a little crop of stinging nettles close by and the interest little boy said to me, if I get stung by them a lot, will I become immune? And I told him, no, but I had read that chewing up plantain leaves and putting them on the stinging nettle bites would alleviate the stinging. So he thought he'd try it. I told him that the fresh plantain might not taste very good to him because he's kind of picky about his flavors or his taste. And, but he went along with the experiment. He picked some leaves and began chewing them up and what a face he made. Then he touched the stinging nettle with a finger and began to rub the leaves onto the nettle bites as he danced around with pain. It didn't go away very fast. Then I remembered reading that it needed to be like a poultice instead of just rubbing it on. Oops. Needless to say, I won't get him to chew those leaves or touch stinging nettle again on purpose. We could have mashed the leaves up really well instead of chewing them. Now I say again, know your plants and application purpose. Make a poultice rather than rubbing on if that's what it asks you to do. Now you can eat flowers. Look at what we can do. Spring and summer equal. You can have all the flowers you want. Autumn, not so much. They've gone to seed then. And then in the winter, there are a few blossoms out there, but not very, very many. Uh, pineapple weed, it's a little bit like chamomile, just the blossom of it. You can, um, and that and yarrow make really good teas. Um, and then elderberry, properly called elderflower. Those are really good uh, dipped in batter and then uh, fried. They're really tasty. You can eat uh, this um, rose, Wild rose blossoms, they're really tasty. Put them in, um, in your salads, or you can uh, even do that and steep them in a tea and have a little bit of a, a flavor. The leaves are also good for tea, but they have a real sweet. I just like to just pull on the petals and eat them when I'm walking around seeing them. And then also in the bottom picture there, you have berry vines, blackberry vines. And believe it or not, those at, are the flowers of those are really, really tender and nice. And then you have your dandelion blossoms. When you pick your dandelion blossoms, just pinch off the blossom part. Try not to get the bracts underneath the green part um, because that it has a little bit more bitterness. But these are really good. They're really good batter dipped and fried too. Uh, and then your clover, of course, they are just a sweet thing and great addition to any uh, salad or there's other things that you can, um, you could put them in stir fries, whatever. Just don't, don't worry about using them. They really are um, tasty uh, blossoms, all of them. Just remember that when you pick the blossom, you are picking the seeds, so don't overdo. Now, some of the favorite things that we, we like to harvest are the berries. In the spring, you're not going to find very many. They are just beginning to make their blossom and their berries, and so they're not really very many ripe. In the summer, you get lots and lots of berries. In the autumn, you even get more berries. In the winter, there are just a few out there, but there are some. And some of our favorites, huckleberries. There's also wild blueberries too out there that, that look the same, but there is a little bit difference in them. Uh, they're both just tasty. In the bottom, there is a kinnikinnick. I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but it just grows a low growing vine and the Berries are a little tart, uh, well, quite a bit tart, but mixed with others, both that and your um, Oregon grape are really good mixed with other berries, so they uh, take on a good mixed flavor. The, the Right next to the blueberries and above the knickknick is the thimbleberry, and thimbleberry is not one of my favorite ones. It's, um, it's out there all along your rockways and everything. To me, they're a little bit like flannel and a little bland, but there's a lot of people that really do like them. Now at the bottom, you have your blackberries again here, and there are three blackberries in our in our area. 
there's the Himalayas, which are these with the round leaf, and then there's the evergreens that have a more serrated leaf, and then there are the Pacific. Those are the Pacific are the ones that when you're walking through the forest and you get a blackberry vine wrapped around your ankle, that's the Pacific. But those are our very favorite. When we go out, that's what we look for. We go up to the mountains and we find a clear cut, and inevitably they're going to be there, just a multitude of them. And then strawberries is just up above and oh my goodness the sweetness of the strawberries one time when we were camping i found some that believe it or not some of those berries were the size of a dime i was just shocked and i harvested enough came home and made a little batch of jelly but usually they don't get that far because they're too delicious to just pick and eat as you walk along and then there is the salmon berry and they are anywhere from a yellow color to a deep uh, pink red uh, when they're ripe and they, they're a nice tasty juicy berry. There aren't, they come along gradually all summer so you're never going to find a great amount in one spot and you try to beat the bears and the animals to them and maybe you'll get some but they are really a tasty berry. And then your Oregon grape next to that is, it's another tart one but it makes really good jams and jellies mixed with, with other berries or even actually by itself some jam. And then up above is your elderberries. And they have been really touted um, for a long time with um, having uh, help colds and, and flus and coughs. And so um, it's important that um, the world is out there uh, making sure that these are really good to eat for our both eating and health. Do not eat the red ones. The red ones are not the edible ones, but the dark blue ones are the edible elderberries. And um, they're easy to propagate if you wanted some on your little, if you have some property and want to start some elderberries, just find a tree somewhere and cut some starts off and get them rooted and, and they're easy to propagate so you could have your own elderberries. And then the top one is the black caps and these are, uh, they're also called black raspberry. And these are just the sweetest. These are one of my very favorite. We like to harvest them when we can find them. And they're just, just delicious, just really, really, really tasty. Okay, now we have the seeds. And there are seeds that you can harvest. You can see spring, not many, summer, a few more, but then autumn is your good time to harvest your seeds. And sometimes in the winter too, you can harvest quite a few. And so some of the ones that, that are good to use, the um, mallow here again, and this is the one that I showed up above that we could use as a green, but the mallows, as young seeds, they're really tasty. I, as a child, used to even pick them and eat them all the time because they were so tasty. And then your, your plantain at the bottom is the seeds all along the stem, the wide mouth plantain. And then you've got your, um, your amaranth and it has thousands of seeds every year and those seeds believe it or not can are viable for 50 years so that's why we keep having pigweed come up in our gardens because they've been there for a long time and are just taking their time sprouting but that gives us nice fresh greens also and next to it is the uh, sheep sorrel and uh, you remember as a young green it was really tasty the new little leaves coming up and if you're driving along and you look out across the field and you see kind of a, an orangey shade out across the, for, the field, that will be your sheep sorrel in seed. It really is pretty to see. And then your rose hips over at the side, they are another good seed to harvest. Some people don't like the seeds, so they scrape the seeds out and then just use the, the flesh that's surrounding the seeds um, that makes good jams and teas. It's a, it's a good little, it's high 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 in vitamin c and then of course we have the um the dock up above and this was as a child we used to call it the um, indian tobacco we go along and we grab a handful of it around the base and then go up and the seeds would just come off into our hands and we throw them in the air so we were being a good seed disperser and making them just fly everywhere but they it's it's really They've got a lot of seeds on them too. And of course your mustard has seeds too. It's really a good seed uh, to, um, for spice. It's, it's got a lot of spice. And a lot of these seeds, you're, we'll talk about it a little bit later, how to use them. But 
there's there's seeds that you can harvest really really good and then we do have root now if you notice on the on the graph this the um spring is the best time to harvest your roots because they are the tenderest and the sweetest uh summer not so much then autumn you can you can dig some for it depending on what you want them for in winter you're going to find that in the autumn and the winter they're going to be tougher and they are not the ones that you will eat as tender young shoots you will uh, use those grind them up and roast them and use them for like teas and that sort of thing but your dandelions uh, make a good roasted and uh, ground roasted and dried they make a good tea and then your um, cattails like i said are the best in the spring but they can be dug in the fall they're just not quite as tender and you can dig the mustard root and the uh, um, chick, uh, chicory is the blue flower and it is another one that they use the root for a substitute coffee by grinding roasting and drying the root and then up above is the burdock it, it's the one that has all those burrs that catch onto your clothes as you walk by it and its root is really a big long good root that in the spring it is just a tender nice root but then in the fall it also makes a good coffee substitute and then uh, there's the wild onion and as i'm telling you all these things know that there's more out there there's more i just we just don't have the time to go through them all but um they're really good the japanese use the burdock root extensively in their cuisine okay now we're going to see something a little bit different and this is have you ever heard of secondary edible veggie plants in America, we throw away about 200 pounds of unused or of usable garden trimmings per person a year. Can you believe that? Commercial celery, if you've ever grown celery of your own, you know that it isn't anything like the commercial celery. The commercial celery that, they, that we get, they have blanched it, they have put soil up around it to blanch it and keep it compact. But if you plant a celery, it will be a plant that, that spreads out more it's got slenderer uh, uh, stems and it's much more pungent much more flavorful than the store-bought one and you can even let it go to seed and harvest the, the seeds for it too the celery seeds but um, you can use believe it or not you can use the leaves of broccoli cauliflower carrots green beans lima beans beets cucumber eggplant kohlrabi okra pepper radish squash turnip those you can use but you need to cook them do not eat them raw so uh, don't throw those away they've got good flavor and they've got a, a different taste to, to broaden our tastes um, you can also use the onion and the celery of course but you don't have to cook those and then in the stems of all those garden plants you can eat broccoli stems cauliflower stems squash stems cooked or raw and you can also pickle them so don't throw those stems away and then flowers you can actually cook or use a squash flower you remove the anthers and you wash it and you can use it in salads or you can stuff it with rice herbs cheese and then fry it it's quite tasty also nasturtiums are edible both their blossoms and their their leaves and then you've got your chive blossoms and your garlic scapes don't throw those away use those up and then as seeds the seeds of the nasturtium you can pickle and make your own mock capers isn't that amazing that we haven't been using all those wonderful treasures okay now we are going to go into different methods of preserving your harvested tre treasures and I do have this as a printout for you. So all the things that I'm saying, you will have on a printout. Um, and you can do the short term. You need to let them sit in water about 10 minutes for any bugs and to get dust and dirt removal. Know that sometimes your aromatic components might be compromised. So even flowers, if you can't wash, or if, you, if you can get away with not washing them, don't wash them because they will lose some of their flavor and aroma. 
Um, so don't wash them unless it's necessary, even with berries. If it's not necessary to wash them, don't uh, try not to wash them. Like your blueberries and, and or your huckleberries and things, they're, they've got a good firm skin and, and they do not need that much washing. Okay, in the book, front, your, front Yard Forager, which is in your resources, Melanie Voras tells how to do this and that first picture is what she has done. Soak and hydrate the greens with cool water for 10 to 20 minutes. Thoroughly rinse and drain. Use salad spinner to remove as much water as possible. On a cutting board, cut the bite-sized pieces if desired. Then spread out on a clean cloth to completely dry for an hour to three hours. Roll the towel up with the greens inside, secure it with a rubber band, store it in the crisper or bottom shelf in the fridge. Unroll, use some of the greens, then roll it back up and place it back in the fridge. For fresh, tender herb, you can, or plants, you can put them like in a jar with um, a water and place them in the refrigerator. And they stay good for several days. If you want to, you can put a plastic bag over the top of them and that would even uh, help it a little bit longer. And then flowers, you need to store those in um, a, con a sealed container in the refriger refrigerator for no more than a few days. And fruits and berries, can be stored in a crisper drawer in the fridge. You can put berries in a shallow towel lined container with the lid lightly ajar. So each one of the methods is a little bit different to help preserve it for longer. Roots dislodge the dirt by agitating in several changes of clean water. Gently scrub with the vegetable brush, leaving as much of the root sheath as possible. Then wrap it in a dry towel and place it in a sealed container in the fridge for no more than a week. Okay, now we're gonna go into freezing. Um, another way of preserving plants is freezing it. Although their appearance and texture can change, leafy greens can be blanched, and that means briefly dipping them in boiling water, then immediately put them in ice water, like I have these here. And then um, uh, after the, uh, you drain them, and then you can put them in your container and label them uh, with the date, and what it is in your container and then freeze them right that way. And then next to that picture, I have um, berries that I have put in a, a plastic Ziploc freezer bag that uh, some blackberries that I had frozen. And then um, berries can still retain their flavor and, uh, and are fine in juices, teas, certain dishes like desserts. You can even thaw them and make jam or jelly later on. The difference between jam and jelly, jam is the whole fruit and jelly is just the juice. Berries can either be mashed and placed in the freezer containers. A little sugar helps keep the flavor. So I add just a little bit of sugar with them sometimes. And if you want whole berries, you can place the berries on a cookie sheet and freeze it overnight and then take them off of that sheet and put them in freezer containers. That way you can uh, take out a few berries at a time for like smoothies or things like that. I do that a lot. Be sure to label and date. How about uh, taking a rose petal and put it in ice cubes and freeze it that way. So then you have this pretty little ice cube floating around in your special herb drinks that you've made or your plant drinks you've made. Okay, now dehydrating. Uh, drying plants can extend the harvest and preserve them for future use. Dry as soon as possible after gathering. Pick leaves, flowers, and seeds after the morning dew has evaporated and before the full heat of the sun arrives. Except for roots, do not wash the plants unless necessary. Roots and large fru fruits should be chopped or sliced before drying. The ideal spot is a warm place out of direct sun, low humidity and good air circulation. It takes several hours to several days, longer for roots and thick flowers. Leaves and flowers should crumble and the stem snap. Roots and fruit need to be clear, dry all the way through to the middle. Now here's four methods that I'm gonna tell you about in drying gathered fruits. You can, number one, you can hang them and tie them in bundles and then hang them upside down in a well ventilated shaded area. You can hang them covered with the paper bag with holes poked in the side for air, for air ventilation, but this keeps them dust free. 
It also works for seed heads to keep them from falling out in, onto the floor. Okay, number two, drying racks. Stretch wire mesh, nylon mat, netting, muslin, or even cheesecloth over a wooden picture frame and staple it into place. Or purchase herb racks. Spread plants in single layer and turn them as needed for even drying. And then you have the dehydrator, and that's what I have. I have a, one of my screens with leaves that I dehydrated in that in the picture. A food dehydrator allows you to control the temperature and the air circulation. Spread herbs in a single layer and dehydrate at 95 to 115 degrees. Check regularly. Okay, the fourth way is in an oven. Use this method only if it can be set very low at 100 degrees, and not very many of them do or you can um, use the pilot light. Line a baking pan with parchment paper, spread plants out on a single layer, leave door slightly ajar, checking regularly and turning if needed for drying. For storing the dried plants, protect from heat, moisture, and sunlight, they damage them. Um, good store, you can good store them in glass jars with tight lids in a cool, dark, dry place. Be sure to label and date. If stored properly, they will last one to two years. Now, if your recipe asks for fresh, use half if you're using a dried amount. And then we have canning, and you can can your berries, juice, pie filling, jams, jellies, pickles. Store in a dark, cool area for longer life. Use USDA approved sources, such as the Blue Ball Book for canning and preserving, and so easy to preserve from Georgia University Extension. It's an excellent source and I call it the Bible of food preservation. Now I see that there's a few of you that have raised your hands and you probably have questions. If you didn't hear at the beginning, write your questions down and at the very end of the presentation, I will answer those questions for you. Okay, now guess what we are going to do? We are going to go on to probably what you've been wanting to do. As a child, I didn't care for raw onions or cooked asparagus, but as an adult, I love them. So tastes do change. Every new wild food is unknown and mysterious. John Callas from Edible Wild Plant from Dirt to Plate has said, and this came out of his book, there are three approaches that you can take and I want you to listen and decide which one you fit in. Number one, you can timidly examine it, hoping you will not come across anything disagreeable like flavors, bitterness, or rankness. This makes you sensitive to and looking for the disagreeable. And if there is any, you are darned and determined to find it. Or you can be number two. You can hope that it will taste like a familiar comfort food that you already know. How could any new food compare to the old food? Or number three, you can view this new sampling as an adventure, looking for the plant's uniqueness, characteristics, and potential. An open-minded anticipation of potential will result in a more pleasurable and useful wild food kind of experience. And if you are like me, all sorts of culinary options will pop into your mind. And I have really found that true. I have had more fun. Look what you can put your wild edibles in. Soups, stir fries, casseroles, sandwiches, salads, condiments, breads, jams, jellies, desserts, beverages. What else is there? Oh my goodness, this is so fun. Okay, and main dishes, think about soup, stir stews, stir fries, casserole, quiche, lasagna, meatloaf, rice, pizza, fritters, quesadillas, pasta noodles made with greens, savory crepes with stinging nettles, amaranth with caramelized onions. Is your mouth watering? Anything that you would use spinach, kale, or other cooked greens in, you make it. You can use it. Zuppa Toscano, my favorite from Olive Garden. What about using something else instead of the kale? Would work great for me. You can have dried elderberries and others in stuffings. 
You could grind rose hips in soups and stews. There's your vitamin C added right in. You will lose some vitamin C when you cook, but it'll still have a good amount there. Is your, is your mouth watering and are your thoughts reeling? Okay, now sandwiches. Pocket bread, uh, bake, burgers, paninis, wraps, you name it. You could put cooked greens or fresh greens in them, any one of them, and it would just add to it. This is on the one um, uh, pocket bread there has some purslane in it, yum. Um, and then think about salads, whether it's a fruit, a pasta, a potato, a toss salad, anything. Try greens to spice up dishes rather than be the whole thing. In other words, if you're going to do uh, nettles, which this is nettles that you can see up here, try adding it to something instead of it being just nettles. Mix it in with something else. Um, th think about the result you want. Do you want a filler? Do you want something pungent? Do you want something bitter? Do you want something tart? Add your berries to your fruit salads. Add your vegetables, uh, your, your greens to your um, even some chopped stems and whatnot into your pasta salads and stuff. Just, just think about it, just think. And then condiments, this is just unbelievable what you can do here. You can make it, put it in salad dressings, any of the different things in salad dressings. You could even flavor some oils for uh, seasoning with oils. You could put, how about some uh, bitter cress in, or shot weed in your butter and then spread it on your bread. You can make vinegars, beautiful, tasty vinegars with the, the blossoms of the uh, pink. Um, yeah, anyway, um, you could do uh, pickles. Pickles, you could do it out of cattails. Japanese knotwood, garlic, mustard, both of them are um, invasive species. Eat them up. Sow thistle buds, dandelion buds, burdock roots, spruce roots, or spruce tips, I'm sorry. All kinds, just, just think of your um, um, options there. And now we're looking at beverages, and this is going to surprise you with this too. You can do tea, coffee substitutes, juice, smoothies, you name it. Tea from leaves or flowers, your blossom weed, uh, your pineapple weed blossom. If you put a heaping teaspoon in a quart of water and let it sit and steep, you will have a nice, tasty, refreshing drink. You can infuse fresh or dried things into your drinks. Dried leaves and, and hips from the ro wild rose are really good in a tea. Dried blackberry and strawberry leaves for teas. Roots ground and roasted, then dried for coffee substitutes. You could uh, do your ju berries into juices and then mix or add citrus juice for it to be like a lemonade with berries. Um, pineapple weed coolers. Make your smoothies with greens or fruits. Um, Doug Benalil, one of the books that I recommend to is Northwest Foraging. And this is what he says about teas, he says, there is a large number of teas that have special interest to me, some with claims of curative powers. To me, the most important value of any tea of any kind is the chance to sit down, wait for the tea to cool enough to drink, and to chat with good friends. It isn't medicine or magic, it's calmness in a busy world. Now, Think about breads. Oh my goodness, look at this. Muffins, biscuits, quick breads, yeast breads, pancakes, cornbread, bagels, crackers. Use chopped up greens and seeds as ingredients or garnishes. Pineapple weed flowers and biscuits. In bread, you might add a half a cup of berries if they're juicy, then this decrease the liquid. Or you could do two to three tablespoons of chickweed three tablespoons of dried and finely ground stinging nettles, one to three tablespoon of dried pineapple weed flowers, one to two tablespoons of rose hips, one tablespoon of dried bitter cress. Just go on and on and on. Just know that you can make and use those 
it's all those things in your your breads okay and now jams and jellies there's all kinds of jams and jellies you make again the jelly is made from the liquid and the jam is made from the whole fruit with the pulp and i've made dandelion jelly i've made elderberry jelly i have not made the uh, oregon grape jelly somebody else did that and, and um but i have made lots of different jellies and they are so good you could do um any kind of the fruits spicy plants not weed elderberry dandelions rose petals rose hips i've done rose hip jelly yarrow red clover spruce and fir tips so all that kind of the fir tip jelly was just really astounding it tasted just just a little uh, kind of a citrusy but it was it was really good too and then we have our dessert my goodness you can put them in pastries cookies elderflowers in cookies or any of those uh, things you can add to them cobblers ice cream i made um fur tip ice cream and it was delicious just a hint of christmas that's what the kids said just a little citrusy with just a little tiny kind of a fur flavor a, a pine flavor in there um, curly dock and sheep sorrel cooked with a little bit of sugar and lemon juice makes a rhubarb like sauce okay um, i hope your mind is whirling with new options and ideas just go for it and let and just create there's a lot of recipes in some of these books that i recommend there's also recipes online just go for it and just enjoy and search out those things now we do need to go into the precautions there are uh, poison or toxic plants sometimes can be misidentified because they have similar uh, characteristics as edibles so absolutely be positive of your identification and this one i have a copy for you too with some um uh, it tells about them characteristics and stuff of it your nightshade it's a it's a vining plant and it has a beautiful purple flower little flower star-like flower with a real bright yellow stamen in it and the berries are red and you can uh, if you just happen to to if you see red berries or purple flowers look at it closely and you'll see that's what it is ground cell i have been pulling it out of the garden and uh it's just a um it doesn't grow that tall it's about a foot tall i think at its tallest but it's got kind of serrated leaves and then the flower is like a lips it's a tube kind of because it only shows just the very top shows the yellow color and the flower is is all enclosed around the rest of it the, the outside of it um and then there's the creeping buttercup it is another one that is um uh, got poisonous all of the the ground soul the whole family or the whole part of the plant is poisonous as with the nightshade all parts of it are creeping buttercup all parts are poisonous and it is another creeping one also foxglove is another one that is um deadly poison it was what they used to use dip made digitalis out of for heart patients and um, you just have to be really careful with it that you are not um, uh, consuming it at all it's real pretty and it's a perennial um, it'll blossom the second year that it comes up all parts are poisonous uh, the fox love all parts are poisonous yeah um, and then we have our lupin and everybody i think has seen the lupin it grows out in the field everywhere it's also toxic to animals too um, Oh, I skipped the petty spurge. I'm so sorry. The petty spurge at the bottom there. It's another small leafed plant and the flower is green. You don't hardly even see a flower and realize that it's a flower because it's just the same color as the plant. And it's growing everywhere too. I saw it in my son's um, driveway just right up next to the cement walkway. There was some growing there. And, uh, and then of course the lupin. And all parts of the, of the petty spurge are poisonous. The lupin, uh, all parts are poisonous of this. This is in the pea family. So it's got pea pods in it that might attract kids, but do not let them consume them because they are poisonous. The field bindweed, it's a morning glory plant that crawls along the ground and uh, leaves and the roots are poisonous on this one. 
um, let's see, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Now this one is the one that you need to watch out for because it looks a lot like your um, chickweed. The leaves and stuff look the same, but if it's blooming, you can obviously see that it is not that little white star flower that is uh, with the, the chickweed. It has bright orange flowers, and if you look close enough, the stems are square, whereas the, the uh, chickweed is rounded, and then this one also has no hairs on the stems, and the chickweed will have hairs on, on alternating in between each leaf. They'll alternate to the other side of the stem. So if there's no hairs and it's a square uh, stem, then stay away from it. And then, of course, we have the poison hemlock, which is deadly deadly poison. These others will give you tummy aches, might, might give uh, the right people, it, it might actually kill them, but your poison hemlock is deadly if it's consumed and it is very dangerous. Um, it grows, it, when it starts growing, it looks a little bit like parsley and then it gets tall and has the umbral flower at the top. And I know there for a few years, um, I assume it's still the same, that if they found, if the county found them growing on your, your property, you had to eradicate them. If they came back and they were still there, then you would actually get fined because it is such a dangerous plant. And then the, and this is actually the poison hemlock is also the tea, the drink that was given to Socrates to kill him was from this very plant. And the water hemlock is another one that's related to the same, in the same family, and it is also deadly poison and should not be, you don't even handle these plants. If you do happen to touch them, then go wash your hands because they're that dangerous. So uh, just learn and study and know these plants that are um, very dangerous to us. Now there's more journeys that you could take with uh, the wild edibles. There's a lot out there that information on medicinal. Scientifically, they haven't been proved, but they have proved that there are certain properties of some of the plants that are helpful to us and soothing to us and are beneficial to us as far as, as medicine. But that's another journey, another one for you to take. And then there's another one with dyes. Um, there's many, many plants out there. There's skins, flowers, roots, tree barks. They have all been used for hundreds of years and it's an art all of its own. Um, even, believe it or not, avocados make a pink dye. But there's a lot of fun things out there for a journey. If you want to take this journey, it would be a lot of fun. And there's also ed uh, edible mushrooms out there. There's a lot that are poisonous. There's a lot that are edible. But you need to be an expert or have information that's really, there's four of them that we go out and harvest because we know that they are good. But other than that, be very, very, very careful with those. Okay, here we are again. Do not consume anything unless you have absolute proof and have that you've correctly identified the plant with at least four characteristics from at least three reliable reference sources. Absolutely so important. Only experiment with plants that you know are edible, only experiment with plant parts at their proper life stage, and know how to prepare the plant parts. Important. Okay, these are my resources. And these are books that I really, I really enjoy and I'm pouring over them all the time. Edible Wild Plants, Wild Foods from Dirt to Plate by John Callis. And he's got a lot of fun information in there, great information. He, was a P, he has a PhD in nutrition and he's taught classes on wild foods at Portland State University and Clackamas Community Center along with community education. And he has excellent pictures of plant life. And this is the one book that shows plant life from the very beginning, from seedlings to growing to flowering to um, seeding. So uh, lots of good information. And he has some really good recipes in there too. And then Pacific Northwest Foraging by Douglas Dewar. And this is a very informative with year round harvesting of 120 plants. But they, these take place from South East, Alaska, British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon. It's great Native American plant traditions in this book and great pictures. There's no recipes, but a lot of good information. He has a lot of less traditional plants that um, he has um, given us information for. And then their front yard forager by Melanie Barassiera. She is um, 
uh, from Seattle and she is more into the urban sites. She covers them like lawns, parking lots, vegetable gardens, flower gardens, parks, green belts, vacant lots and roadsides, lots of common plants and some great recipes. And then Northwest Foraging, the classic guide to edible plants of the Pacific Northwest by Doug Benalil. And this is not in color, but it's got great drawings and thorough information. And it's alphabetical, so it's easy to find the plants. And it, there's good local plant foraging information in there and some very good recipes. Plants of the Pacific Northwest by Jim Pojar and Andy McKinnon. And that, this book covers plants in our area and not just edible plants, but has a lot of great Indian, uh, great Native American uses and traditions that show how they were used in their normal lives. It's been quite interesting to read. And then the North American Guide to Poison, Common Poison Plants. Um, it's very informative and comprehensive and really helps in identifying plants that we need to avoid. And then of course, there's a US Department of Agriculture plants database. If you go into plants.usa.a or usda.gov, um, there's you can search database by scientific names or common names. It's got great images, fact sheets and plant guides, classification and characteristics information by states. It, and it is also free. And then a blog that I found that I've quite enjoyed was Three Foragers blog. And um, I'm sending this resor resources to you also in the, the printout. And um, he ha they have wild food recipes, edible plant identification photos, videos, and even YouTube presentations. So there's a lot of good information for you to research and look for. Um, so now we have talked about the five P's, practicing safe foraging, pursuing forage treasures, Pre preserving found treasures and preparing food treasures. And then precautions are a must. I hope that you have been, um, had your eyes opened and I hope that you go out on your journey and just find lots of new things and try lots of new things and be safe and enjoy your foraging. Thank you very much for attending this presentation. Okay, yes, thank you everyone. Um, I just want to remind everyone that uh, now we're ready for the question and answer uh, period. And uh, I said at the beginning that um, uh, I disabled the chat function, uh, but now it is open. And so uh, if you would like to um, ask Viona a question, you can go to the chat icon at the bottom of the Zoom window um, and then just type uh, in your uh, question. Um, and I just want to let you know that um, we do have a lot of people here. We're definitely going to try to get to uh, as many uh, questions as we can, uh, but there, we might not get to all of them. So I apologize in advance if that happens. Um, and I also just want to reiterate what Vian was saying is that um, when I send out the link um, that will include the um, recording, um, also some information about uh, nature scaping of Southwest Washington. We'll, we'll link to those um, handouts that Vion was sharing with you. Um, so uh, let me just uh, check in here. Um, I do see there's some more uh, coming in. Um, and I just see one here. The first question is, um, there seems to be an uh, infinite number of apps uh, to assist in plant identification. Is there one you find especially useful? You know, whenever I am going on the internet, I try to look for uh, apps that are um, uh, college apps or university apps, things like that, or USA, because you know that they are authentic, because there is a lot of information out there and some of it is a little sketchy and some is, is very valuable. So um, I gave you the, the uh, plant database for the USA, but if you're looking for something that's real authentic, you can almost always go to uh, university information. They have lots of information, but you can search out and use your smarts. Um, I see a question here about a specific plant, uh, a pineapple weed. And it mm -hmm. says, how do you tell the difference between pineapple weed and the plant that looks similar but burns your eyes? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I, and there again, you've got me on that. I don't know what you're referring to, but I will certainly look and see that. 
the pineapple weed has no little uh, uh, petals coming out. It's just got the little mound there and that is, and, and I don't know if that is included in what she's looking at or not, but that's one of the characteristics of the pineapple weed. Um, here again, go and do your research and look and see what the difference is that you can find on it. I'll have to look that up and see what it is you're talking about. Uh, I have another question here um, about carrot tops and do carrot tops have to be cooked uh, yes. to be eaten? Yes. Yes. Um, and then um, there's a question, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing the name of this plant right, uh, ground cell. Ground cell, uh-huh. Uh -huh. um, does that have an edible look-alike? Um, not that I know of, no. It didn't seem to have one. It, it's really, um, I suppose that you could uh, think that some of the dandelion-like plants, um, like the cat's ear and that sort of thing, has the yellow blossom, but it's got an open blossom where this is just a little closed up blossom with the yellow peeking out the top. Okay. To my knowledge, there isn't another one. Um, and then I had one about, um, let's go back here. Oh, about uh, squash leaves. Um, and if you see a powdery um, mildew, are they still edible? Hmm, hmm, that's a good question. I wouldn't eat them, but that's a good <laughs> question. But uh, I can't give you a def definitive on that, but uh, it's a, it's a um, you know, it is a fungus disease. And so I, yeah, I would, I would not eat them. I would just eat the pretty green ones. Uh, I have a question about uh, rose hips. Um, when is the best time to harvest rose hips? Right after the first frost is when they are the sweetest. They can be harvested all winter long or even all, you know, whenever they're, they're made, you can harvest them. But their sweetest time is right after a first frost. I um, uh, have one um, attendee that says they have wild cucumber all over. Is, is that edible and how? No. It's not, not edible. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, one says, uh, are there any parts of Queen Anne's lace that are edible? You know, I think that they, they do um, eat the root a little bit. Um, I searched that one out a little bit more so I could give you a definite answer. But if you go into your um, um, information on it on the internet, it'll give you that good answer. But I think that the, the carrot came from that plant. Uh, that's how it evolved was from the Queen, the queen Anne's Lace. Um, I would hesitate to eat it until I knew for absolute positive. I would have to know that one. Uh, and then a f um, follow up with that uh, carrot tops question. Uh, um, wh why why do they have to be cooked? Why do they have to be cooked? That was the recommendation. Mm -hmm. I can't answer that. It just was the recommendation that those vegetables be cooked. Good question. I need to jot these down so I can search. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have one here. It says, "Is there a uh, poisonous uh, purslane look-alike?" Yes, there is. Uh, it, it's not exactly like it, but uh, here again, if you really search uh, the, um, the um, characteristics and really identify, you'll be fine. Um, then uh, I have a question about um, native hazelnut. Um, can you tell uh, any information about harvesting and storing and using uh, <laughs> that? Yeah, they're out there. Uh, they're far and few between, and the squirrels will probably get them before you will, and the uh, but the, uh, the birds too. But the seed and the native um, uh, nuts are so tiny that you'd have to take a lot to get a cup full of nuts of nut meat. Uh, so th to me, they're a novelty. If you find one, it's great, but um, they're just hard to find. But they are edible. Okay. Um, and, uh, oh, is there a, do you know if there is a black elderberry uh, found in Western Washington or just the poisonous red elderberry? Um, you know, there's, there's red elderberries here. Um, and there's also the purple or the black re uh, elderberry here. The red just are not, they're, they're not, na they're not not uh, poisonous. 
or uh, toxic, but they are not good for you. They just are not, they don't taste very good and they're not really good for you. So I don't know if that's the question she asked or not. I don't, don't know if I got it right. Um, let's see here, do you eat tall tumble mustard, uh, plants or flowers or both? Tumble mustard? Hmm. Um, yes, tumble mustard. Mm -hmm. hmm. New name for me. I've not seen it. I don't know if that is a, uh, an ethnic name or if that's an actual plant. I'd have to look that one up because okay. I've not seen that name. Um, have one, have you ever uh, made uh, Queen Anne's lace uh, jelly? No, I haven't. Mm -hmm. Has she? <laughs> um, this uh, attendee said they have a recipe for it and just wanted to hmm. uh, ask about that. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, we have um, a question about have you ever prepared or how would you prepare uh, a wild carrot? Well, that's Queen Anne's lace pretty much oh, would be, you. yeah would be wild kit. And I, and really, um, uh, <clears throat> let me look it up really quick here. Cause I, I really think that they, they caution us not to eat those, but let me just look up, go ahead with another question. Then I can answer that. Okay. Let's see here. Um, actually it looks like, uh, looks like we've got to most of it. We do have, Oh, uh, good. Oh. <laughs> um, one, uh, we do have a note about, uh, pointing out the uses of names, uh, and that, um, uh, one um, uh, attendee said that uh, indigenous and native are uh, preferred terms over Native American Indian when we're, when we're talking yeah. about this. So just yeah, want to share right. that note. Yeah, you're right. Thank, thank you for that. Um, um, I actually, I had, a, I had a, a question since I don't see any new questions. Uh, you mentioned um, that if you're starting uh, to pick a couple plants uh, at first, and I was just curious uh, how how you started, uh, my own, like what were your uh, first plants that you started to forage? Oh, uh, for, for forage, for eating, oh my goodness. I'd have to think on that because I've been doing it for so long. Of course, the wild berries were the thing, first thing that I really did was harvesting was the wild fruits. Um, as far as plants, um, um, oh geez, just, anything out in my garden that I was pulling and finding out it was edible, I was starting to eat. Um, yeah, but berries were my go-to because they were, you know, I don't know, tasty and wonderful, but. Okay. Um, we have um, a question about um, any information on Virginia creeper fruit. Uh, I've been told they're edible, um, but don't know uh, how, when, um, or. Are know. they local? Are they local? Let's see, Virginia cre creeper fruit. Not sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, there's a follow-up coming to that. Uh, North American vine rambles on fences. If that, huh. if that helps um, clarify. Let me let me write that down. I'm, I've got something I'm not. What is it again? Um, uh, there was a follow-up comment to the Virginia creeper fruit. That Virginia. Was Virginia creeper fruit. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And then the additional huh. comment was North American vine rambles on fences. Mm -hmm. hmm. Hmm. So it'll have to be a follow-up for that. Yeah, that's another, because <laughs> that's not a name that, that I have heard um, okay. used at all in anything, but it could be that it is a... Um, you know, just a common name and it may be um, regional or whatever. And, um, and uh, uh, attendee, thank you for sharing the Latin name. I will, I will pass that over to Viam. Oh. So thank you for sending that. Oh, great. Um, See, that's what helps because I can go right to it. Um, and then we have uh, a new question about when is the best time to pick Oregon grape? Mm -hmm. uh, in the fall when it has really, um, really got to its right stage. Yeah. Um, just watch them and you might just taste one and see how sweet it is. And uh, th they're going to be tart. They're, they are never going to be sweet like huckleberries or blackberries. But um, yeah, just in the fall sometime when all of the, it's had all of its time to ripen. Okay. 
I can't find anything on wild carrot either. Can make a make a note of that too. And uh, yeah, just to remind everyone, uh, there will be there will be a follow up email to um, everyone who has attended. So uh, that might be an opportunity where we can um, follow up on some of these uh, some of these questions. That sounds good. Okay. Let's do that. Yes. Okay. Um, and then uh, looks like you know we have one new question. Um, are berries from the sol sala plant edible? Yes. Yes, they are. Yeah, and they're another one that's a little bit tart, but it they they're good. They they are, they're good. They're mixed good mixed with other ones too. They have their own flavor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention that, but that is one of the ones that. Okay. Um, and I two sixty three. I did find Queen Anne's lace here really quick. Okay. Yeah. What's well, called Yampa. <laughs> Um, um, and, the roots uh, are delicious, it says, yes. Oh, the, the roots are edible. Okay. Um, got a question about what are more common edibles you could hope to find easily without going into a forest um, or lands? Just walk out. To, do they have a garden? Just walk out to the garden. Yeah. There's um, Purslane is all around, your chickweed is all around, uh, miner's lettuce you can find easily, your um, um, amaranth, your um, um, pigs, or I mean lamb's quarter, mustard, all of those things are just right out in our yards almost. Okay. Lots of fun things. Um, and let's see here, just want to let her know, probably do just uh, maybe a handful more questions um, before, we, before we stop. Um, and uh, I have one here about uh, uses for, I uh, hope I'm saying this right, uh, camasia, camasia uh, our local bulb. Um, does, that, does that ring a bell? Mm -hmm. Nope. Amethia? C-A-M-A. Is, is that a plot? What is it? Uh, C-A-M-A-S-S-I-A. Camasia, or is it camas? Camas root? Yeah, camasia. Yeah, that's that's your uh, camas root. The thing with the camas root is that it is very, very delicious, but it's got a look alike that grows right with. Oh, uh, Vian, uh, looks like it's frozen. Let's see here. I think we will give Vian just a moment to see if that works. Oh, are you back? Bam. Yes, I am. I'm okay. back. Yeah. Okay. You uh, the froze uh, for just a moment. Oh, sorry. Okay. D did they get my answer to that? The Tamas? Uh, maybe uh, say it one more time. Actually, there there is a look alike with it's the best Tamas, and if the Tamas root is really good, but there is a look alike that is deadly poison that you absolutely have to know that you are absolutely getting the right thing. Um, and. Uh, do you know when is the best time to collect blackberry leaves for tea? Um, any time of the year, any time that they're out there. Um, of course, in the winter they wouldn't be, but you could even pick them and then dry them and use them later for teas. But any time uh, you want to on those leaves. The actual berry brambles, and I don't think I said this, and I'm I'm sorry. You can actually pick the blackberry or the berries, uh, not just blackberries, but the other ones too when they are just young shoots in the spring before they've gotten thorny. The thorns are there, but they're real soft and tender and they're delicious greens to eat. Fresh greens are, are cooked. Um, we have a, uh, some information that's being shared about Virginia creeper and that uh, one attendee is saying, according to the USDA plant sites, uh, Virginia creeper berries are toxic. Okay. Um, also a point about um, that Queen Anne's lace has a dangerous uh, look-alike. Yes. Um, so proper identification yes. is necessary. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, there is. Right, thank you. Um, and then it looks like we just have one more question here and that's, um, are crow berries edible? Hmm, 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 I don't know. <laughs> okay, let me get my resource book here. <laughs> I don't know crow berries, huh? Um, here again, look it up. If I don't find the answer, look it up and it will. And I don't know if that is the common name 
or I appreciated the camas the camasia for giving me the um the uh botanical name because it really helps you get right to it. Mm -hmm. See, I don't have that in this book, so who knows? Mm -hmm. Now that one would have it if any of them would. So I, I don't know. Okay. Um well, it looks like the scroll berries. Oh, we do have the mark. Okay. Uh, um, is it possible to for the questions that I didn't answer or that I had questions on that I could answer those later, or what? Yeah. Well, um, I think um, uh, we'll have the opportunity to send out uh, an email and maybe um, uh, we'll kind of put together a, a doc uh, that is a, a follow up or, or share okay. some share some information uh, that okay. way. Okay. Good. Uh, um okay um and um so uh i think i think uh, that's a good good place uh if, if you're okay with that vion um, that's fine and uh, i just want to say uh thanks again so much to vion graham for this wonderful presentation um just a reminder everyone that uh this is a, a presentation that is uh, co-presented by naturescaping of southwest washington and the camas public library um and we are going to send out a follow-up email uh, probably um, early to mid uh, of next week uh, and it'll have again the uh, the handouts uh, the recording and we'll do some uh, follow-up um, and we're getting a lot of nice notes coming in saying uh, thank you Vion uh, on the oh. chat so um, thank you. so uh, again thank you hope everyone here has a great weekend and thank you so much for coming uh, I thought it was a really great presentation thank you and enjoy and go out and forage <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.